This is Dr. Slava Tereshev. He's a NASA JPL physicist. Um, his areas of research include gravitational and fundamental physics, research in astronomy, astrophysics, and planetary science. He's a 2012 adjunct professor also at UCLA's Department of Physics and Astronomy. And as Les and I began building the, uh, the inviting speakers and getting here, he was really excited when Slava agreed to, to be here. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as we speak about traveling to outer stars, um, to outer space, and actually we are looking for uh, life out there. So uh, last night we received a message from uh, outer space. And so that message came, of course, from the space station. And so our friends on the space station congratulate us with this wonderful event. And to signify the importance of our meeting, they actually send this picture. Notice. This is, the, this is the Enterprise. And so the beginning of uh, space era, the Sputnik is here. And of course, the Enterprise is there, showing the way to the future. Um, and maybe the, this way to the future will be through the gravitational lens, which I will be uh, discussing uh, today. So this is my presentation. And um, a number of people contributed to this presentation. So here, uh, I will introduce, uh, in this presentation, I will introduce the concept of gravitational waves and the physics of it. And then, I guess, uh, uh, later today, we will be discussing different aspects, pluses and minuses, of using gravitational lens for imaging of an exoplanet. And uh, the very idea of uh, lensing actually came from Einstein himself. Uh, before publishing uh, General Theory of Relativity sometime uh, a, little, a little bit more than 100 years ago. He actually wrote a paper where uh, this is a, a, a page from uh, his handwritten notes uh, where he is discussing using gravitational lensing uh, for the purpose of studying the universe. And at that time, he said that it's uh, unlikely. The alignment will be so unlikely so that we will, we will not be able to use it for any practical uh, purposes. So, but later on, uh, gravitational deflection of light actually became the uh, first uh, experiment that was conducted to test general relativity. And you see this is uh, Einstein and Eddington sitting together in Cambridge in, uh, uh, in 1930s. And so essentially, uh, this was the first confirmation of general relativity experiment conducted to test general relativity. This is a telegram from Campbell sent to Einstein suggesting that um, uh, several experiments conducted during solar eclipse actually confirmed validity of general relativity. So, the, so that was almost 100 years ago. Moving on, essentially uh, in, today we know that uh, gravitational deflection of light happening everywhere in the universe. And you see those wonderful arcs. And we use gravitational uh, lensing, micro lensing, uh, um, um, uh, as, a, as a tool to study the universe, as a, essentially distribution of dark matter in the universe. So, but uh, in reality, uh, how well do we know gravity? Can we use it for anything else? So my laboratory, Jet Propulsion Lab, is the solar system. I have a wonderful laboratory, and we fly spacecraft everywhere in, in the solar system, and we test general relativity, gravity, on a large scales. How do we do that? Essentially, let me show you just a little history of tests of general relativity in the in, uh, in, in solar system. For that purpose, we use uh, multiple technologies, uh, planetary, uh, uh, Microwave ranging to Mercury, Venus, Mars, spacecraft, multiple spacecraft were used to test general relativity. We use technique like very long baseline interferometry, GPS, laser range into spacecraft orbiting Earth, then laser range into the uh, uh, retroreflectors left by Apollo astronauts on the surface of the moon, and uh, soon we will be engaged in interplanetary laser range. So this plot shows you how well do we know gravity. And uh, the parameter beta here is indicating non-linearity of gravitational superposition. And the uh, parameter gamma here indicates uh, the curvature of unit mass produced, uh, the curvature of space produced by unit mass. And so general relativity tells you that beta and gamma should be one. As in the course of exploration, solar system exploration, we test with uh, ranging to, uh, to, to, uh, to Viking lander on, on Mars. We test the parameter gamma to less than 10 to the minus 3. Then uh, Mercury ranging, we actually tested both parameters, beta and gamma, uh, making that allowable space smaller and smaller. And so then astrometric very long baseline interferometry led us to even further pre improving precision and test of gravity. Then, of course, uh, uh, lunar laser ranging constrained it even, even further. Uh, the results from Cassini made it very little and very unlikely for any gravitational theory to deviate from general relativity if it will, if, if, if it will, if it will be uh, pre 
pre predicting a beta on gamma uh, outside of this box. And the very, uh, and very recent result, essentially you have, uh, we were able to test parameter beta to very, uh, to, to, to very comparable precision. So in the solar system scale, general relativity is the standard theory when we describe gravitation. So we tested it very well. And as you know, uh, only a few days ago, Nobel Prize was awarded for actually direct detection of gravitational waves that are coming uh, uh, from, uh, uh, with uh, uh, that were registered with the LIGO detector. So gravity is well tested, and it's time to think about gravity as applied discipline. So no longer theoretical discipline, but how, but how can we use it as applied, applied physics? So essentially, we, we use it daily in, uh, in, uh, in GPS, in precision measurements, everywhere in space. And as you know, astrometric mission like Gaia tests gravitation, tests, uh, uh, is achieve, uh, trying to achieve astrometric precision at the level of one micro arc second. But a light coming perpendicular to ecliptic deflected by gravitational uh, field of the sun to eight uh, milliarc seconds. So microarc second is the precision, but milliarc second is how much sun is affecting. So before you get to the state of precision, you have to account for gravity. Essentially, this is how well we know gravitation in the solar system. It's time actually to think about next step, testing gravity and using gravity for the purposes of studying the universe. The idea of using um, Gravitation for that purpose came uh, as, 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 as early as in 1979, uh, came from uh, uh, von Eschelmann. He was the professor at the Stanford University and the chief of radio science team and, uh, on Voyager spacecraft. And essentially, he suggested we, can, we could use it for the purposes of, of communication, interstellar communication. At that time, you would put a single pixel detector in the, focal, uh, in the focal area of the solar gravitational lens, and you use it for interstellar communication. We took it a little bit, uh, a little bit further, and essentially we decided that maybe it, it, is, uh, it is a good uh, thing to have a solar gravitational lens for imaging of an exoplanet. Because imaging, as you know, it's a very difficult task to, to achieve with the conventional technologies. Let's take an object roughly 100 light years away, and we take Earth, and so the Earth at 100 light years away will be an object of roughly uh, 12, uh, uh, 14 picoradian. It's a very small object. To, um, to study this object, actually to resolve this object with the diffraction limited telescope, you need to have telescope diameter of roughly 76 kilometers in space. It is very difficult to make a, te a, telescope, uh, a, a telescope that size. If you actually are able to achieve that, fi that fit and you fly maybe a couple atoms thick mirror in space, which will be 70, uh, 76 kilometers, it will weigh trillion, of, trillion tons. But even that object will be removed from the solar system by solar radiation pressure within one year, so it's a humongous uh, uh, telescope, it, it's, a, it's, a big, uh, uh, it's a big light sail, essentially. So, but uh, to resolve an object with 1,000 pixels, you need to have an inter interferometer with very large baseline. The interferometric baselines that we're talking about are, are going to be 12 Earth radii. And so if you want to make an image, an interferometric image, you need to have a lot of baselines. Uh, each of them will, have, will span the distances from roughly 10 meters all the way to 12 Earth radii. And that's just unfeasible to make something along those lines. And so even more challenging essentially is the signal to noise ratio. If you try to build an image with the conventional technology, you have to collect light for a long time because essentially we are dealing with, uh, with zodiacal light. We're dealing with a lot of, uh, signal, uh, with a lot of issues that affect the signal to noise ratio. And what we estimate, a 50 meter telescope in space, it will take roughly uh, a million years to actually build signal to noise ratio to uh, roughly SNR equal 10, which is quite a uh, uh, quite a sobering conclusion. So, but with solar gravitational lens, potentially we have the ability to actually get, uh, because of the huge light amplification of solar gravitational lens, we think we can make an image within a realistic time, few months. And uh, 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 solar gravitational lens essentially offers us a very unique uh, uh, advantage compared to current technologies because now we need to block with, co with conventional technologies, we must use coronagraphs. Coronagraphs like star shade flying 40,000 kilometers away from the detector spacecraft. And this coronagraph uh, is designed for the purposes of blocking uh, starlight. The parent star light needs to be blocked for us to see essentially the image of an exoplanet because it doesn't shine, it reflects light. So we need to block the point source and that is, uh, w w with this, uh, the major issue is the parent uh, light uh, 
uh, parent star uh, light contamination. Solar gravitational lensing uh, does not have this problem because you resolve exoplanet and the star is magnified many, many, many uh, hundreds of kilometers away from the optical axis. So potential is there, but realistically, how can we make it? So as we think about our next steps out from, from the solar system, we explore our, uh, our stellar neighborhood. And all, uh, of course, we would like to go to Alpha Centauri, and it's a wonderful, uh, uh, it's a wonderful map, and uh, that's a, it's a logarithmic scale here. It's about 100, 100 AU here, and you, you see the Voyager 1 spacecraft, and as you, as you fly away from the solar system, it's just dark space. And it's lots of AU, so it's 2500 AU to get to the uh, Alpha Centauri. But maybe before we get there, we actually will pass by the solar gravitational lens, and which begins at the distance of roughly 547 astronomical units away from the sun. And so this is a nice point to be in. If it offers uh, uh, an imaging capability, let's take those. And uh, so uh, as we, uh, as we uh, develop the wave optical treatment of this uh, object, we actually uh, and, uh, understood that uh, solar gravitational lens in here, so uh, you, you, have a, you have the sun, you have a spherical sun, and because of the uh, light deflection is inversely proportional to impact parameter, essentially light is focusing somewhere at a distance 547 AU, and it's not a point, it's a focal line, essentially, because of inverse, inverse proportionality to impact parameter. And so there are several regions of solar gravitational lens I'd like to discuss, and essentially here we are, we are focusing on the uh, pencil sharp beam around the focal line, uh, uh, around the focal line of solar gravitational lens. The gain here, magnification, is proportional to the ratio of the Schwarzschild radius of the sun, which is about three kilometers, to wavelength of uh, to observing wavelength. If we do this in optical wavelength, like uh, one micron, so this ratio gives you the factor of 10 to the 11th at the optical axis. Of course, with the telescope you average it. Out, and with one meter telescope, you, you're already getting down to roughly 10 to the ninth, but which is which is quite healthy magnification. Magnification is very challenging because uh, look uh, at exactly at the optical axis, you have this huge gain. But uh, you have if you deviate 50 centimeters from that optical axis, you have gain reduction by a factor of uh, 10 already. So you you are somewhat very sensitive to position. And this is the point spread function of, of, this, of this object. And point spread function is challenging. It's not the same as a typical system. Because with a typical system, you have one over R dependence. Here, you have a much larger side lobes. And essentially, it leads to a blurring of the images. And so those blurring, I think, will be, will, we, 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 will be, we will be discussing later today. But the image that you would like to form, essentially, the image is the Einstein ring, uh, which is depicted here from the Hubble telescope. But Einstein rings around in the sun, within this Einstein ring, you will have the image of, uh, of an object you are, you, you are lensing. And uh, uh, let me uh, briefly uh, highlight the uh, sort of advantages of solar gravitational lens and to show some properties of the lens. So of course the image is here, and uh, if you position a telescope, a one meter telescope, uh, roughly 500 or 600 astronomical units away, so one meter telescope is equivalent in magnifying power to 80 kilometers telescope in space. One meter to 80 kilometers, it's just the numbers to remember. It also has a, a very extremely high angular resolution. We're talking about 0.5 nanoarc seconds opt optical resolution achieved with this with this lens, because the lambda over d here is the same, but lambda is the wavelength of your observing, and the d is the diameter of the sun. So that's what you get. So uh, this is the object you, uh, we would like to study and see if we can use it. It's an extremely sharp pencil beam. Essentially, the diameter of the cylinder, which is around the optical, uh, optical axis, if you have uh, this 100 light years uh, uh, away object, uh, the Earth, uh, like l let's say 13,000 kilometers diameter, so we'll be, the uh, entire exo Earth will be compressed to roughly 15, uh, 1,300 meters. So this is the area you have to navigate. 15, uh, th yeah, this 1,300 meters. This is the entire object, uh, that uh, an entire image. So uh, um, basically, collecting uh, in within this, uh, uh, the, the, the collecting power is, is, very, is, is very strong, and essentially. If you position the telescope at, uh, let's say, 750 astronomical units, this is collecting power, magnifying power is, is, is very strong. Uh, let me show you a little movie that shows a, a physics of it and basically a very nice description of uh, the solar gravitational lens, and I hope you enjoy it. Exoplanets. They're just like regular planets, but found in other planetary systems besides our own. So far, over 3,600 discoveries have been confirmed since 1992. 
These fuzzy dots are a few examples of the best direct images that we've got. And these are all gas giants like Jupiter. What we don't have is a really good image of an Earth-like exoplanet. It may actually be possible to get an image like this, but how we could do it may surprise you. We could use the Sun as a lens. The Sun is massive, to say the least, therefore so is its gravitational effect, which warps the very fabric of space itself. When incoming light from a hypothetical exoplanet approaches the Sun, its path is also warped. These curved light rays are brought into focus starting from about 550 astronomical units away from the Sun. The effect of gravity on the deflection of light is inversely proportional to its distance from the center of the Sun. Approaching light rays further from the Sun are not curved as much as light rays closer to it, so they come into focus past 550 AU, which results in a focus line rather than a single focus point. This is the solar gravitational lens. If we take a 1 meter telescope, place it at 650 AU away on the focus line, targeting an exoplanet 100 light years away, how much magnification and resolving power do you think it will have? From a fuzzy dot to a slightly larger fuzzy dot? Not even close. It could resolve details at the scale of 10 kilometers squared. That's like resolving the width of a single human hair on the moon from Earth, or an equivalent resolution like this image of Earth. If instead you targeted the closest exoplanet to us, Proxima b, at about four and a quarter light years away, the resolution would be even greater in the hundreds of meter scale. But there are not as many planetary systems to choose from right next door to us, relatively speaking. The Sun, obviously, does not function exactly like a conventional lens. The Sun's gravitational force warps the incoming light in addition to focusing it, resulting in a ring shape around the Sun called an Einstein ring. Correcting this is a lot more work than a de-warping filter in Photoshop. Adding to the difficulty, we can't resolve the whole Einstein ring at once with just a 1 meter telescope either. If this same example exoplanet has an Earth-like diameter of around 12,700 kilometers, then that will result in an Einstein ring approximately 1.3 kilometers thick. This animation isn't the scale, as a ring would look more like this compared to the Sun. But with those variables in mind, the area of the focus line that our telescope needs to cover would be a cylinder with a diameter of about 1.3 kilometers. You would need a telescope that's at least that size to resolve the entirety of the Einstein ring in one picture. That's 206 times larger than the primary mirror in the Hubble telescope. Fortunately, you don't need to resolve the whole ring in just one picture. Our one meter telescope can image an area on this example exoplanet 10 kilometers squared. So you can think of each picture it takes as a single pixel. You can still resolve the whole ring, you just need to assemble it pixel by pixel. The proposed goal is for a final image with 1000 by 1000 pixels, but that'll take some time as that adds up to a total of 1 million pictures. Before the imaging process can even begin, something has to be done about the sun. The telescope needs to face the sun to image the exoplanet, but unsurprisingly, its light would outshine the exoplanet. Since the Einstein ring is around and outside the sun, an internal coronagraph can be used which blocks the sun and the brightest part of the corona. There will still be some light from the corona mixed in, but not enough to completely overwhelm the exoplanet's light. For the coronagraph to be more effective, the telescope needs to be positioned further back on the focus line. That's why we can't place the telescope right at 550 AU, but still not too far back, as that could add years to the mission timeline. A good compromise would be between 650 to 800 AU. When the telescope is further from the sun, naturally it will appear smaller. The magnification of the exoplanet stays the same, but the Einstein ring is now at a greater distance from the sun's surface, so there's less corona light to contend with. But how far away are these distances really? An astronomical unit, or AU, is the distance from the Earth to the sun. At its greatest distance from the sun, Pluto is almost 50 AU away. Voyager 1 is currently traveling through interstellar space at 138 AU away from the Sun, farther than any spacecraft has traveled. The telescope needs to be almost five times further than that. That distance, while considerable, may not be insurmountable. Here's just one possible hypothetical scenario. Using the currently in development SLS rocket as the launch vehicle, the spacecraft can get to Jupiter within six months. It can use a gravity assist at Jupiter, slingshotting the spacecraft towards the Sun. As it falls into the Sun's gravity well, within 5 to 7 solar radii, its velocity dramatically increases. When the spacecraft reaches maximum velocity through this maneuver, its rocket engines fire, adding to its acceleration and sending it on a trajectory to the focus line. Traveling between 17 to 22 AU per year, the spacecraft can get to 650 AU in about 30 years in the most optimistic scenario. 
but no spacecraft has approached this close to the sun before, so a fairly robust solar heat shield will have to be designed and employed in order for the spacecraft to survive. Once there, the telescope has to move with the focus line and within it, as nothing in the universe is static. The exoplanet orbits its parent star while also rotating around its axis, if not tidally locked to its own star. While the trajectory design can account for much of this, a novel design for the spacecraft itself is still needed for it to move stably within the focus line. One idea is to build the spacecraft with the telescope on one end, tethered to a counterweight at the other end, using ion thrusters for propulsion at this point. The telescope can be pulled in or extended out along this tether to move within the focus line while maintaining a stabilized anchor position. This enables the telescope to gather a sufficient amount of images with less difficulty than keeping an untethered spacecraft stabilized. Using this method, it should take around three months to finish the task. But the challenges don't end there. Each image that the telescope takes is not a neat slice of the full ring. Instead, the telescope builds a rasterized image where each snapshot contributes more detail and magnification of a specific area on the exoplanet. These images end up overlapping each other, which can be considered a benefit as we won't need quite as many pictures for the desired resolution. Next, a deconvolution algorithm will be needed to fix the warped ring. While that may be a considerable challenge, we'll have the variables we need to correct it. The position of the spacecraft, brightness of each image at those positions, and the optical properties of the solar gravitational lens. If we are able to overcome all of these technical hurdles, we will finally have our first high-resolution image of an exoplanet. Using spectroscopy, we can analyze the light from the exoplanet in more detail than ever before. Gases absorb and emit their own distinct wavelengths of light. So when we analyze light from its atmosphere, we'll be able to accurately define its composition. Is the air breathable? Are there any telltale signs of life in the atmosphere, like methane, for example? Suppose there's actually intelligent life, and they too have electricity. Well, if it's nighttime and they turn on the lights, we'll see them. But there's more. Radio waves are just another wavelength of light. If ET is broadcasting, those radio transmissions will also be magnified, but not to the extent of visible light, as the radio spectrum is actually distorted by the interference of the sun's corona. While utilizing the solar gravitational lens is a daunting technical challenge, it still may be achievable in the near future. In fact, NASA's Innovative Advanced Concepts Program, or NIAC, recently accepted a proposal led by Dr. Slava Turyashev to further explore this very concept. This video is based largely on his paper and follow-up discussions with him. So I hope this presentation gives you, this movie gives you a little, a little bit more perspective of what lensing is, the promise of the gravitational lensing. It is a challenging, uh, it's a, it is a very challenging way to image exoplanet. And so the challenges are really, uh, are really uh, sort of uh, st strong challenges before we actually will, uh, will be able to make the image of an exoplanet. First of all, I'd like, to signal, I'd like to point that spectroscopic signal is extremely high here. So we get about the signal to noise ratio of a million within a second. So spectroscopic signal coming from the entire planet, and so if we split this uh, uh, this uh, this signal to a million bands, we, we potentially can get a very good spectroscopic investigation of exoplanet atmosphere in uh, in a broadband fashion. So, spectro so spectroscopy is very strong. Imaging is challenging because of the uh, significant blurring. Gravitational uh, lens is actually has a very strong spherical aberration, and so spherical aberration leads to blurring of the image, and so the challenge actually how to uh, make the image in the presence of the blurring. One way of doing this is rotational tomography, and so this technique is, uh, is, is developed recently, and so potentially rotational tomography uh, and with rotational deconvolution, we were able to demonstrate that potentially up to uh, 300 pixel images are possible, and maybe later today during the uh, break, uh, in the afternoon, we'll discuss the rotational deconvolution technique, because it enables us to actually make the image uh, a, much, uh, strong, a, a much harder, a direct deconvolution. With direct deconvolution, we essentially get a significant signal to noise, uh, uh, signal to noise ratio reduction, and which will uh, result in maybe long integration times. But this study is ongoing, and so we are, we are conducting simulation, and hopefully next time we'll meet, or maybe in the papers that we are about to write. So uh, you, will, uh, you, you will see more details on this, on this approach. But uh, I'd like to summarize. The spectroscopy signal is very good. Rotational deconvolution is very promising. Direct deconvolution is strong but challenging, but possibly it actually will lead to very important results. And uh, the, um, we actually now have the design for a coronagraph. Uh, compared to the coronagraphs that were developed for, uh, for W first mission, 
where you block a point source at the distance. So you have extr external coronagraph, which is a, a star shade. So with this, uh, with the star shade, the, uh, the attenuation ra ratio is 10 to the minus 9. We don't need that much. We just need to block the sun to the level of solar corona at the area of the uh, Einstein ring. And so potentially 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7 is needed for that purpose. Uh, and essentially that was done. We have the design for coronagraph. So we are able to actually design, uh, we are able to build a coronagraph uh, with a, with a ratio of 10 to the minus 6. It actually, uh, the throughput, the optical throughput is roughly 15% compared to W first, 2%. So actually there is a lot of light, and uh, but still it pushes uh, t t t t the telescope size to larger uh, parameters. Uh, another improvement possible here may be flying an external coronagraph, the star shade, which will ultimately result to smaller and smaller apertures, maybe flying several small spacecraft for the purposes of imaging with one uh, uh, with one star shade. The challenges are not end up here. So one, uh, one of the challenges I would like to highlight here is essentially our sun is not static. You see the motion of our the center of mass of our sun with respect to solar system barycentric frame because it's being pulled by Jupiter and Saturn and, by, and, and the big guys in the solar system. But uh, the advantage here is that I mean the, uh, we know the motion of the planets very well. And so potentially this, uh, the, this effect is known and we can be smart with SLS system. We will be able to have propulsion on board to compensate for this type of motion. So, but still it is doable. I think we'll discuss it later uh, to, uh, today during the session devoted to solar gravitational lensing. And so that's the summary of our effort, at, uh, uh, NIAC effort that we are uh, uh, conducting now. So by the end of February, when we are required to submit our reports, we hope to bring you information about the, the, the first uh, first phase of our study of this mission within NIAC, but essentially the benefits of uh, this mission is actually making sure that we will be able to make a continental scale images of an exoplanet. The promise is there. We should, uh, the promise, uh, we should be able to make, um, uh, 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 we should be able to, to see uh, uh, continental lines, topography, weather patterns, but uh, so this is the promise and the challenge is how to get there. So uh, with this I'd like to finish my presentation and hope you have a uh, uh, good impression about gravitational lens. Slava, you mentioned that this, uh, the solar corona produces an extension of the focal range, but there's another effect, of course, I'd like you to tell us about. The corona is a very turbulent region. There are flares, the stars are, uh, the, is a very active area. That produces, of course, uh, a blurring of any image. How important is that, and how well do we know that? So, um, yes, uh, the studies of solar corona indicate that there is significant inhomogeneity and temporal variability in solar corona. The static factor, yeah, the static contribution is the most important, but the variability can actually be uh, recorded and, se and, and sent up to the spacecraft essentially to compensate for it. The hope is that we will be able to monitor the sun uh, during the mission lifetime and should be able to compensate uh, the, uh, the contribution from the solar corona into the, uh, in the, in the data analysis.